Well, welcome everybody. I hope you've been appreciating the good weather of this week. It's lovely to have you here at church with us this morning. Welcome to our series, I Once Was Lost. If you're wondering why Christians like to get together and sing on a Sunday morning, it's because we know we've been found. <laughs> so if you are found, if you are happy and rejoicing that you know Jesus and he knows you, then let's lift our voices up and join in together this morning as we praise his name. Rescued me, sing it out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave, not the tunnel, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive. I 
light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Let's pray, everybody. Father, thank you for this time that we have this morning. Thank you for this new opportunity just to hear your word, to fix our eyes on you. And Lord, whether we are watching in this morning and we feel like we really know you and love you, or whether we're looking in and just asking questions and we don't really know whether you're real or not, I just pray, Lord, that this morning you would make your presence felt amongst us. Lord, as we hear your word, as we hear the testimony that's coming, I pray that you would speak powerfully through it. You would open our hearts, open our minds, open blind eyes that we might see. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we started a series called I Once Was Lost. And we're highlighting that there is a lost sense of being. It's a life which has lived detached and separated from God. And as a result, unable to, to truly understand who I am, what I'm here for, or, or where I'm going. There is such confusion, such an identity crisis happening in the world. And it doesn't surprise me when so many people are living without any point of reference, no compass, no solid rock beneath their feet. Like Jesus said, if you build on shifting sand, at some point it will all come crashing down because that's what happens when life is lived as if God doesn't exist. But it doesn't have to be like that. And there is a, a marked difference in what it looks like and how we, we live life when we come to know God. When we get found. You know, every authentic Christian has at some point cried out to God and has asked Jesus to come in and be Lord of their life. You know, discovering that there is a relationship to be enjoyed, a calling to be fulfilled and a future to look forward to will change the course of your life. Without him, there is just me trying to navigate life on my own, working to make sense out of my existence with no assurance that I'm here for any specific purpose at all or that there is anything else to come when I inevitably die. It's a, it's a pretty hopeless and frightening reality. Lost. Lost. But the good news, as we started hearing last week, is that God came looking for us. Jesus was sent on a mission. A mission. It, was a, it was a rescue and recovery mission to find us and to restore us to our rightful state as children of the King so that we can know our innate value, so that we can know what true love is, so that we can be set free from the past and we can have a certain hope for the future. Like I said last week, no one is too far gone, too bad or too damaged that God cannot reach them. In fact, Jesus was known for hanging out with some of those who were considered the worst in their society. Listen to this as we turn to our Bibles this morning. You can follow along in the, the notes section if you're watching online. Or open your Bible and we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, starting from verse 1. And it says this, it says, Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. I mean, what is a notorious sinner, by the way? Well, they are those who are well known for getting things wrong. Well known for breaking the rules. Maybe you can identify with that title. And yet, they were drawn to Jesus. They wanted to be in his company. They wanted to hear what he had to say. I mean, what does that tell you about what Jesus was like? Compassionate? Non-judgmental? 
welcoming, all those things. I mean, too many people today, they don't want to hear about God because they think he is the opposite to that. That's why we need to talk about Jesus more. But, you know, not everyone appreciated his fraternizing with notorious sinners. Verse 2, this made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. I mean, they thought that if you ate with sinful people, then you were condoning their behavior. They thought you would be guilty by association, that their company would make you unclean. Verse 3, so Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, he said, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. I mean, Jesus was saying loud and clear that lost people matter to God. That no matter what people have done or or where they've been or where they've gone in life, they are worth going after. I mean, how reckless to leave the, the 99 other sheep just to go after the one. But he sees that one who is lost as just as valuable as those who are already safe and know their value in God. Note that the shepherd in the story says, I have found my lost sheep. Not any old lost sheep, but mine. You know, it's not a case that God only loves a certain people group. And he definitely doesn't just love those who do the right things and make the right decisions all the time. He loves all of us. We are all made in his image. We are all his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he has planned for us long ago. That's Ephesians 2.10. But, you know, lots of people don't know that yet. They don't know how much God loves them. They don't know their true value. They don't know that he is looking for them right now. And there is a new found life to be discovered. None of us ever would know that if Jesus hadn't come close. If he hadn't shown love and compassion to the least and the last. If he hadn't laid down his life as our good shepherd. He was making the point in this parable that in the same way the shepherd found his lost sheep and brought it home. So it is possible for anyone to be found by God no matter how lost they might currently be. That's good news, right? Because that includes you and it includes me. You know, if you're a parent, if you've ever lost one of your children on a beach or in a crowded shop, then I can guarantee that you didn't think, oh, well, I've got other kids. One missing won't matter. I mean, we, we lost our eldest daughter on a beach in Cornwall when she was six years old. And I say lost, but she actually ran off (laughs) from the water's edge and she couldn't find her way back to where Rach was was sitting on the beach. And when I finally got back with little Harry and, and Rowan as a baby in my arms, she wasn't there. But we didn't just get on with our day thinking that she might find her way back somehow. We didn't pack up and leave, wondering if she'd find her own way home at some point. You know, in her lost state, with her limited knowledge, you know, that was impossible. Impossible. Now, finding her became our top priority. And thankfully, we found her pretty quickly. 
and there was relief and rejoicing all round, despite the fact that she had chosen to run off. You know, a six-year-old on her own is defenseless and in danger, just like the sheep in the story. Without the rest of the clock, without the rest of the flock, under the care of the shepherd, you know, anything could have happened. And it's the same for us, the same for all of us. Without God, without our good shepherd, without our church family, we are also in grave danger too. And when God finds us, when, when we realize he is there, you know, he doesn't come with words of rebuke. In fact, the, the story of the lost sheep tells us quite the opposite, that just like with me and Rach, there was great rejoicing. Jesus was telling the notorious sinners that were there, as well as the grumbling religious elite, that when someone makes that turn to him and is brought back to the fold, then there is a, there's a party in heaven. I mean, don't think you can quietly become a Christian and no one will notice. Because every time someone makes that turnaround decision, it, it sets up a Mexican wave of praise in heaven. It's that big a deal. You know, we encourage everyone who turns to Jesus and is making that heart decision to follow him, to get baptized at the earliest opportunity so that we as a church can celebrate with you. You know, if that's been you during this time of lockdown, if that is a decision that you've recently made, then please let me know. Let us know so that we can plan your baptism as soon as that is physically possible. There's a lot of rejoicing when you know you've been found. You rejoice yourself. God's rejoicing. The church is rejoicing. Heaven is rejoicing. It's an amazing thing when somebody makes that decision to invite Jesus in to be Lord of their life. So let me introduce you to Uton Braham. This is a modern day example of the story of the lost sheep. So thanks for joining me, Uton. Most people that are watching in this morning will know you from Kingfisher and you've been involved in helping at Fusion for a number of years now. You've been coming to Kingfisher for a long time, but I know that it's not always been like that for you. And so I wonder whether the, you could just tell everybody this morning about what life was like for you when you were growing up, when you were small. Well, I was taken into care when I was five years old. We went to a place in Malvern. There was six of us originally and only four of us could go because my younger brother and sister were too young so there were six of you yeah they're to be taken in to be fost put, put into a home so they were fostered and four of us went to children's home in Malvern. so you were split up yeah basically and how long were you in Malvern for i think seven years so from the age of six did you say five the age of five to the age of 12 yeah and then what happened and then a, a home opened up in a place called Sedgley, which is just outside Dudley, which is closer to where my parents lived. Yeah. So they moved us to there. So you were brought up pretty much through all your early years in yeah. care. I mean, what was that experience like for you? The care homes wasn't too bad. The school was quite hard. You know, there was a lot of racist, yeah. racism going on and a lot of bullying and stuff like that. So not the easiest of starts. No. And so that was, took you through to when you were what? I, I left school in 1981. When I was 16. Yeah. And yeah. And I stayed in care till I was 18. But you were telling me, <laughs> from what I know from your story, that life didn't really get any easier when you left care. No, like my life, well, while I was in care, I, was, I used to get in trouble with the police. I used to steal things, not that I needed to steal them or I wanted them. I used to just take them anyway. And I used to get into fights all the while. And so when you left care, Things pretty much just carried on as they Yeah, just carried on did. the same, yeah. I got managed to get me a flat and um, I got a job, but, I, you know, I was still getting in trouble, but not as much. I wasn't stealing, and, but I still ended up, ended up fight, having fights with different people. And there was one particular occasion which resulted in the police being called. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, there was, there was a big fight outside this pub, 
because I used to be a rude boy and we, there was a lot of skinheads around at the time and there was a big fight which resulted in me getting arrested and charged with a, first of all, I was charged with a fray mm. and then they dropped it for to GBH. But I ended up in court and I got nine months in prison. So, I mean, not a lot of people know your story. The no. life for you growing up wasn't easy. Well, no. certainly wasn't a barrel of laughs by the sound of it. No. Just in, getting into a lot of trouble. Yeah. Um, growing up in, in a care environment, probably where there wasn't an awful lot of care going on. And, um, and then released at the age of 18 and still getting into a lot of trouble. So, that, I mean, what we're talking about at the moment is this sense of being, being lost. And um, I know at the time you said you probably didn't even feel that you were lost, but in terms of just living this life, which had no sort of purpose or yeah, no sense meaning. of direction, no meaning. No. So when did things start to change for you? Well, I, I, met, I saw this girl keep walking up and down the road, giving out Bibles. Giving out Bibles? Yeah, giving out <laughs> Bibles. And there was a woman who used to live in the flat next door to where we lived. I, I knew her name, but I didn't know what number of her flat was. And yeah. then I saw this girl with her the one day, which is now Paula. So Paula being your wife of yeah. many years. Yeah. And um, so I thought, oh, I will pop around there. She did invite us for a coffee, but we didn't go around at first because we thought there was something wrong with this woman because mm. she was so hypo all the while. <laughs> but anyway, we managed to get to get around there and we went up to the flat because mm. I knew Paula would be there. So it just went off from there. I did ask her several times to go out and I think she said something like, you know, you got an angry face oh. <laughs> or something like that. So basically that was a no. But obviously she got to know you. Yeah. Well, like, she saw I, beyond I that give hard up. exterior. I, I, no, I didn't give up. I kept asking her. She kept saying no. And then one time she just said, yeah. And then it just went from there. Persistence. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> so you got to know Paula. In fact, you ended up marrying Paula. Yes. Paula was a Christian at the time. She was. You I was not a Christian. You weren't no. really interested at no, all. Not at all. And then there came a move to, to Gloucester. How did that come about? Well, I was, Paula was training to be a nurse in Kidderminster. I was living still in my flat in Dudley and I kept going over there and coming back. And then one day I, I said, you know, I might as well stay here. And she said, well, it wasn't supposed to be, it was unofficial, but I ended up staying there for three years with her. And then when she qualified, her friend, her best friend now, who was there at the time, she says that she's got a job in Gloucester. I didn't know where Gloucester was. Mm. I'd heard of it, but I didn't know where it was. And um, she says, oh, I can get you a job starting next week if you want one. But the only trouble is we didn't have nowhere to live. So the next thing I know, Paul says, you know, we'll go over and have a look at some houses. And before I know it, we bought one. <laughs> Which I didn't mind, it's as long as I had somewhere to live, you know what I mean? So and we this ended, is your house that you're currently that we're still in? in. Now, yeah. How many years have you been in it? We, had, we bought the house in 97. 97, so yeah. it's 23 years this yeah. year. And of course, that's just down the road from our church. Yeah. And Paula started coming along, but... I didn't. What, what did you think about that? Well, I didn't mind Paula going to church because I knew that she was a Christian. But it, I thought to myself, well, it wasn't for me. That yeah. was, you know, that's for other people. So what changed? I don't know. One day I just, she was going to church and she says, well, I'll see you later. And then I got a bit curious and I thought, you know, shall I go around? And I thought, yeah, I'll just go around anyway. And, you know, if I didn't like it, because I heard this, I had this theory of mine. Yeah. That, you know, as soon as I walked through the door, I would be grabbed and dragged to the front and made to sing. That's what that, we always do in church. That's, <laughs> that, that's the way I thought things would happen, but it was completely different to that. People were friendly, they were nice, there was singing going on, but it wasn't, I just ex expected to see a lot of old people, Yeah, you know, standing at the front. But in fact, you saw but, a lot of people a bit more like you. Yeah, a bit more, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you started coming along, and, and at what point did you start praying yourself and believing that, that I don't Jesus know it was you. it took me a few months to get in, in into it and then I, I was given a bible I mm. can't remember who gave it to me but somebody gave me a bible and I thought I took it home and I just put it on the table and I never and then I don't know I just got looking at it and you know I just flick through the pages yeah. and then I just started reading it and the next thing I know I started coming to church more regular and then I met your wife and she, I knew that she was doing things around the church, so I, I just got, yeah. got interested in that, and then they ended up doing working with the, the little ones, 
Which is uh, what you do. Diffusion, what I do now. Which is what yeah. you do today. Which, when you think about which it. Which is it's amazing. This when, is a life transformed, everybody. All them years ago when I didn't care about anything or anyone. Yeah. To now. And yeah, it's, as, it's definitely changed my life. Well, you, you know? now know. You well, know yeah. you're loved. You oh, know you're well, cared for. Well, yeah. You know and I know I have friends who I can trust, I, you know, and they trust me, which yeah. is a good thing. I don't have to worry about anything, which is nice. Yeah. Not having to keep looking behind your shoulder and thinking, oh, is my things around? You know, is my phone still there? Or, Absolutely. So that in itself is a, a good feeling, really good. Well, listen, if you want to hear any more of Uton's story, because we only literally touch on it here, then do reach out to him, do um, contact him. And I'm sure he'd be really happy to fill you in on what else has been going on in his life. But I just want to say thank you so much, Uton. You're welcome. For sharing with us this morning. All right. How many times have you found me wandering In the rubble of yesterday's hope Way down with burdens, barely standing by I am desperate to see you again To see you again Running into your arms of grace With no reason to hide away It's not the first time I've been in this place I'm coming home again Again, how great the cost that paid my journey back. You gave your only son and carried me home. How I am chosen, how else could I respond? I've been captured by your unfailing love Your unfailing love I'm running into your arms of grace With no reason to hide away It's not the first time I've been in this place I'm coming home again I'm welcomed home again I'm running into your arms of grace With no reason to hide away It's not the in this place I'm coming home again I'm welcomed home again for your arms are open wide your grace takes me back again you always take me I'm running into your arms of grace With no reason to hide away It's not the first time I've been in this place I'm coming home again For your arms are open wide Your grace takes me back again You always take me back There's mercy in your eyes Just thank you Lord for loving me There's nothing like
like your love Your arms are open wide Your grace takes me back again You always take me back There's mercy in your eyes Thank you Lord for loving me There's nothing like your love you know, there are a number of times in the Bible when we are likened to sheep. Sheep that have a tendency to wander off from God's path and to follow their own. Sheep that have strayed away from the safety and protection of the fold. You know, if I was to ask you right now where you think you are as a sheep, <laughs> what would you say? I mean, maybe you are going your own way. And as it stands, you're not even thinking there's a problem. You don't even feel lost. Or two, maybe you are feeling lost. Maybe you're wondering, who am I? Where am I? What's life all about? What am I here for? What am I meant to be doing with my life? Where am I going when this life is over? If you've got all those questions, maybe you're just feeling lost. Or maybe you've heard the shepherd calling. Maybe you're exploring what it means to know Jesus and you're, you're making that turn towards him. Or maybe you already have, maybe you are on his shoulders right now being carried home. You know, all of us who have come to faith in Jesus can look back and recognize those stages. Like it says in 1 Peter 2 25, once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. I find that so reassuring that I have a guardian of my soul. One who is watching over me. One who is guiding me. One who has a way already marked out for me. One who came after me when I was lost and without hope. One who was willing to lay down his life for me. One who can forgive me and restore me and lead me as I choose to follow him. Psalm 23, very famous psalm. You know, it illustrates this so beautifully, the relationship between the shepherd and his sheep. Have, a, have another listen. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley. I will not be afraid for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honour me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. I can only encourage you this morning to turn to your shepherd. To listen for his voice. He's your guardian. He already calls you his. And he wants you found. And he wants you to know what it feels like to be carried on his shoulders, to be rejoiced over, to know his presence, whether you are going through peaceful streams or darkest valleys right now. He wants you within the safety of the flock, not out on your own. So I'm talking to those of you who have never known Jesus as your shepherd, but I'm also talking to those of you who have known him. Because even Christians can sometimes wander off track again and lose sight of where God is. And if that describes you, then it is never too late 
to turn back and to cry out to God again. He hasn't ever left you. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your mercy and your loving kindness. Thank you for your great compassion and your desire to save us and to bring us home. Thank you that we have a good shepherd who we can trust in and rely on. One who has come looking for us, though we were lost and without hope. Father, I pray for reconciliation for all those who are crying out to you this morning. That through the death and resurrection of Jesus, they would experience your saving power. And counter your everlasting love. And realize the good plans you have already prepared for them. May there be great rejoicing in heaven today over all those who are choosing to put their trust in you, choosing to commit their lives to you, choosing to set their hearts on following you. Amen. You know, if, you've, if, that, rel- if that relates to you, if you can pray that from your heart and mean it, even if you don't yet really understand it, God always answers those who are seeking wholeheartedly after him. Always. And so I'm praying that you will hear his voice. I'm praying that you will know his arms being wrapped around you right now. As he puts you up on his shoulder and sets off back for home. If that was you, if, if this is the first time or, or maybe a time where you've, you feel like you, you, you're coming back to God, you've wandered off and ended up getting lost again, then please, please let us know. You can let us know online right now or you can let us know via our Facebook page or just email us. But let somebody know so that we can support you. We can pray for you. And we can rejoice with you. It's the best decision I ever made when I invited Jesus to come in as my Lord and Saviour. And I know it's going to be the best decision for you to change your life. So thank you for joining us this morning. Westgate service is coming up at 11. And we'll be back here at 6 o'clock for the next in our Walk of Grace series. This has been brilliant. Um, just We're going through the whole book of Ephesians, really understanding the background to it, what was going on in the church at the time, and what God was saying to his people that is still relevant to us today. If you want to experience and know what grace really is and live a life which is worthy of God's calling, then I'll see you back here at six o'clock tonight. Have a great day.
will start soon As we wait for the change to come from you We exalt you to come from. 